Here we go. All right. So this whole technology thing is fascinating and interesting, and I'm not very good at it, but thank you very much, Elliot, and welcome to all of you fellow gardeners out there. I have to be really impressed at such a hot, warm, beautiful afternoon that you're here learning about vegetable gardening. And one of the things that I wanted to share with you today, I guess the most important thing I wanted to share is that when I started vegetable gardening, I just sort of thought of all the vegetables as vegetables. And I've gotten to know that they have different personalities. Some like to grow slow, some like to grow fast. They like different temperatures. And here are, oops, look at it, here's a picture of me. Um, here are a, picture, a list of about a dozen vegetables, and these are the ones we're going to talk about today. And we're going to talk about some of the unique things that make them different. And then while I was thinking about these vegetables, I kept coming up with different garden terminology and vocabulary that helped explain what I was trying to say. And I didn't know a lot of these words when I started um, vegetable gardening, and I didn't understand why they were important. So I wanted to share these with you as well. But since it would be really boring to just sit here and describe or define all of these terms, what I've done is I've matched each term with one of the interesting vegetables. And you'll notice that it's not alphabetical anymore, because what we're going to do is we're going to talk about them in the order that you're going to plant them in your garden. And then one more thing, when we do these presentations, a lot of times people will ask, can I plant or grow thus and such? And the answer is usually yes, but you have to do something special. So let's see if we can put this all together and see what it's going to look like. Can I grow my own garlic? Yes, but you have to plant it in the fall. So just so that we're all um, in agreement on terms, when you go to the grocery store and you buy garlic, you buy a head. That's this big thing is a head. And then you break it apart to cook with it. And these pieces are cloves, cloves and heads. So when you plant garlic, you're actually going to plant the cloves. And you're planting them in the late fall. And this was a huge revelation to me when I got studying because um, you don't plant seeds in the fall. It's too cold for them to germinate. But cloves are like bulbs. So think of it like daffodil bulbs. When we plant daffodils in the fall, what we're doing is we're giving them chance to grow these roots during the winter so that they can support the new growth of the bulb when it warms up in the spring. So each of these cloves is like a little bulb. And each one of the cloves will make a new head. There's anywhere between eight and 14 good sized cloves on a head of garlic, depending on the variety. So that means one head of garlic will grow eight to 14 new heads of garlic. And there are lots of different flavors and types of garlic. You can buy them at nurseries in the fall or late summer. And a lot of times the organic gardens in the area will be selling them in August. And some of the CSAs have them for sale as well. You can plant the garlic you have in your refrigerator or that you have in your kitchen. But a lot of times the store-bought garlic is treated with something to keep it from germinating. And so you'll usually have a lot better luck and you'll have a lot more variety if you buy seed garlic from a reputable grower. Now, there's two, two main types of garlic that you can grow. There's hard necks and soft necks. And when we're talking about the neck, we're talking about this part right here, right above the, above the head. The hot necks are harder, hotter, they have a lot more flavor, and they don't keep as well, which means they really have that flavor for four to six months. And soft necks are a lot milder, but they keep almost a year, and they're the ones that we see braided. And then the other interesting things about hard necks is when they grow these, um, this is the stem, and these are flower heads right here. They grow these stems and they make these really fascinating curly cues. They call these scapes, and they recommend that you cut these off and don't let them go to seed or bloom because they're just taking energy away from the head of garlic you're trying to grow. And then you're going to harvest your garlic when the leaves start turning brown, and this is usually in the middle of the summer, um, middle of the July, sometimes as early as first of July into June, but 
um, usually it's the middle of the summer. Don't wait for them all to turn brown. Um, right in this area looks really good. Okay, now what about asparagus? I was in the grocery store and organic asparagus was running $4 a pound. Can I grow my own asparagus? And the answer is yes, but you have to plan ahead. You have to prepare your planting bed and you have to be patient because asparagus is a perennial. And that means that it comes back year after year after year. You, you don't have to replant it. They say that a, a healthy asparagus bed will last a generation. So with that in mind, what they recommend is that you dig a deep trench, maybe 12 inches deep and 12 inches wide, and put a lot of organic amendment like compost down in the bottom and then put your dirt back in. And when we buy asparagus, usually we buy what they call roots. These are the asparagus roots. And mound the dirt up in the middle so that the roots have a nice comfortable place to sit. This center part here is called the crown. And this is where the asparagus spears will grow. So we want the crown just a couple of inches below the surface of the soil when we fill this trench back in. And then that first year, so you're going to do that early in the spring. The first year, you're not going to cut your plants at all. You're not going to harvest any asparagus because the, those roots need all the help they can get getting nutrition from these plants to um, get themselves established. The second year, you might be able to cut a couple of spears. And by the third year, you should have a pretty good crop. So you can start cutting these or breaking them off when they're six to eight inches tall. And you can see here in this bed, they have several, a couple that are ready to go and a couple that are almost ready to go. And then over here, they've got these tall, skinny ones. And what this gardener is doing is this gardener is letting these grow because once that crown, those roots in the crown start making these tall, skinny pieces, it means it's getting tired. And you need to let these grow like you did that first year to replenish the roots. When asparagus grows up, this is what it looks like. It can be five or six feet tall, and it's all ferny like this. The fronds often fall over, and it'll turn yellow in the fall. So it's actually a really fascinating plant to grow. So garlic and asparagus were both really unique in their own way. Garlic was a bulb. Asparagus was a perennial. Everything else on our list is going to fit into one of two categories. We're going to talk about warm and cool season crops. So this is a garden with cool season crops that are planted. And our list includes peas, lettuce, broccoli, carrots, and onions. So here's some lettuce and here's some peas, and these are maybe onions, and broccoli would fit into this group. The thing with cool season crops is that you're eating parts of the plant. You're eating seed pods, leaves, roots, stems, and even flower buds, which is what you're eating with broccoli. Warm season plants, are different. Corn is a grain, it just needs a lot of, of heat to grow, but the rest of these um, plants on our list are botanically, they're considered fruits. They are a structure that the plant makes that has seeds inside. So we don't usually think of them as fruit, but in a botanical way they are fruit. So with our warm season crops, we are asking this plant to germinate, to grow, to maturity, to make a flower, to make fruit and ripen the fruit all before fall. So the warm season crops need as much help as they can get. So we'll talk about these in order. We'll start with the school's cool season crops because it's spring right now. And one of the handy things with cool season crops is what they call succession planting. And here's a calendar that gives you an idea how this works. You can start planting cool season crops as early as middle of April if you give them a little bit of cover, and I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. And um, they can handle a light frost and they can handle cold, cold soil. So if you plant middle of April, you could be harvesting by the end of May or into June. You can plant another planting of that same crop in May and be harvesting it in June. These um, cool season crops don't like it in the heat of the summer but you can start them again toward the end of August when the nights are getting longer and you can be harvesting in September and into October. So you can really extend your planting season 
by succession planting with cool season crops. So I told her I'd give you an idea how you can um, protect those plants if you want to start them early or if you want to take them late into the fall. And there's all sorts of um, ideas online of putting milk jugs over them and so forth, but this is one of the easiest ways if you've got a whole bed of um, cool season crops. They call these low tunnels. This is PVC pipe that you could buy in the plumbing section of a hardware store. And it keeps, and then we cover it with plastic. The plastic keeps the rain off of the dirt in your bed. And um, it helps the soil to warm up. And I've got a meat thermometer <laughs> that I um, have designated for my garden. And I go out, I don't so much anymore, but when I started, I would go out and um, check the temperature. And you can get the temperature, the soil temperature in here at least 10 degrees warmer than outside just by covering it with plastic. Keep the rain off, keep the wind off. And a couple of things I want to say about this, you notice that he has this anchored all the way around the edge. And I picked this picture because it's not one of the fanciest ones. It looks like he's actually using what he's got on handy around the place. But he's got his plastic well anchored. There are little clips here that are hooking the plastic to the arch, but those clips are not strong enough to hold on to this plastic when it gets windy. So you have to anchor this plastic some way on the ground to keep the wind from carrying it away. And the second thing I want to say about this is this works really well super early in the spring when we have those long, cold, um, rainy days and overcast days. But as soon as you get into the middle of April where we start getting sunny days mixed in, the sun will turn this into a sauna. And you can actually cook your plants with all of it close like this. So when I first started, I would run out and I would open the ends during that um, day and then I would go out and close it up again at night. And I'll tell you what, I got tired of that really fast. So now when we get to that part of the season where we're starting to get sunny days, I open one end and I just leave it open. And it, it really um, increases air circulation, makes sure that these plants don't get too hot and they do just fine. So these P, um, PVC, I'm sure you hear, there's a little clip here that's holding the PVC pipe to the wood. And you get these in the electrical section because these are actually used by builders to hold electrical conduit when they're building houses. And this makes a really easy way to hold these um, PVC pipes in place. But if you don't have a raised bed, another option, this gal has taken a piece of rebar and she pounded the rebar into the soil, probably six to eight inches. And then she's just putting the PVC pipe down on top of the rebar. And you can buy the rebar cut into lengths at places like Home Depot or Lowe's. So that gives you some alternatives and ways that you can extend your season. Let's go back and talk about some of these individual plants. So one of the questions, can I get my peas to keep growing instead of stopping when they're only three feet tall? And the answer is yes, but you have to choose the right variety. All peas like to start in cool weather, and so you can plant them early in the spring. And there are several varieties we can plant. These flat ones are called snow peas. The, the edible pod peas, the big fat ones, are called snap peas. And then the ones where you actually pop the peas out are called shelling peas. And all of these could be grown on a long, tall vine, or they can be grown on these short bush peas. And you'll have to look at your seed packet to see whether you've got the tall vine peas or whether you've got bush peas. Um, it'll say on these that they grow five to six feet tall, and it'll say on these that they grow three to four feet tall, and it'll usually say bush peas. And the other thing with your seed packets is that they'll usually say that your bush peas don't need to be trellised. But at least in our climate, they need some sort of support because they will just flop over on the ground and with a heavy rain, the peas are down there in the mud and the slugs come along and they eat them and it's just a mess. So they do need some sort of support. Another cool weather crop is lettuce. And here the question is, um, can I grow lettuce that tastes good? My neighbor's is always bitter. And the answer is yes, but you have to harvest it before it starts to bolt. So the name bolting means that it's going to flower 
or it starts flowering and it's trying to go to seed. So lettuce will sit there when it's cool weather and it'll, it'll hold in the field, is what we say, for quite a long time. And then all of a sudden you'll get a nice sunny day like we had today. And all of a sudden, and this isn't just lettuce, this is spinach and the other greens, um, you'll get this tall stem that comes out of the middle and it'll start growing a flower at the top and it'll start going to seed. And your lettuce bed will look like this. What's happening is this plant has decided it's time to do what it wants to do, which is make seeds. And it's taking all of the energy that it had in its nice, tender, juicy leaves, and it's putting all that energy into making flowers. And so at this point, these leaves get tough and they get bitter. And there's no going back. You can cut this stem off and you'll never get those nice, tender, sweet leaves back again off of this plant. So if your lettuce bed looks like this, it isn't anything that you did wrong. It just means the lettuce has moved on. And unless you like bitter lettuce, you may as well tear this out and throw it in your compost pile and plant some more. So another cool weather crop is broccoli. And if you've grown broccoli, you might have encountered some little green worms. And here the question is, can I grow broccoli without getting those little green worms? So let's talk about growing broccoli for a minute. Broccoli is one of my favorite vegetables to grow because you get a lot of food off of one plant. First, you can grow this beautiful head of broccoli. It likes it in the fall. And then when you cut this off, you can see the stem here where it was cut off. The broccoli plants will make more little heads of broccoli, little tiny ones. And these are just as sweet and just as edible. They call them side shoots. And once you cut these off, it'll make another row down below at the next set of leaves. And so you can get food off of a broccoli plant for anywhere from two weeks to a month, depending on the variety. But back to the green worms. So I was out in my garden today. This is, um, for those watching the, the recorded version, May 27th. And it's our first really, really hot day in May. And lo and behold, I saw one of these guys. This is a little white butterfly and they come to your broccoli plants and they also visit the other members of the same family. So that would be cauliflower, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. They're all cousins. And these guys lay these little tiny eggs on the underside of the leaf where you don't notice them. And they hatch out into these very innocent looking little green worms. And you can already see there's some damage here on this leaf from the worms starting to eat. A lot of times these little worms don't do a tremendous amount of damage to the broccoli because the, you're not eating the leaves, you're eating the heads. And I do find green worms in the heads. And you know what, I just pick them out and I don't tell anybody. But if you're growing cabbage, these little baby worms get into the cabbage in between the layers of the cabbage leaves and they can destroy a head of cabbage. So, um, your alternatives for getting rid of them, you can try turning your leaves over and washing it off with a jet of water, or once your um, worms get bigger, you can hand pick them and feed them to your chickens if you have chickens. And then if you decide you've got enough of a problem that you want to use a chemical, we, the chemical that's recommended is we abbreviated BT, here's the big old Latin name. But if you go to a nursery and tell them you want BT for your um, broccoli plants or your cauliflower plants, they'll know what you mean. And in master gardening, we don't recommend that you use chemicals unless you absolutely have to. And we really recommend that you stay away from pesticides because pesticides kill the beneficial insects and the honeybees as well as whatever it is you're trying to go after. But BT is different. It's not just a general insecticide. It only um, kills caterpillars. And the only caterpillars that are going to be on your broccoli plants or your cabbage plants are these green worms because those plants are fairly bitter and other caterpillars don't like them. So as long as you're only spraying your um, cabbage and Brussels sprouts and um, broccoli and that kind of thing, that kind of thing you'll be just fine. And if you'd like to stay away from chemicals completely, you can use what's called floating row cover. And as you can probably get an idea up here, floating row cover, it's a spun 
um, synthetic fiber sheet. And you can lay this down over your planting bed when you plant your seedlings and give yourself a lot of slack in the middle and the plants will grow and they'll just push it up as they grow. Um, the rain goes through here. It's thin enough that the rain comes through just fine and quite a bit of sun goes through. So the only thing that you have to do is you have to make sure that the edges are anchored down so the butterflies can't go underneath. You see here, they've used those same arches they used to extend the season to hold their floating row cover up. Okay, so what about onions? Can I grow onions from seed? And the answer is yes, but. <laughs> so there's a couple different kinds, types of onions that we like to grow. These are green onions. They're um, sometimes called bunching onions if you look at seed packets. And that's because the growers put a rubber band around them and sell them in a bunch. These are called bulb onions. And this particular crop is Walla Walla onions. So you can grow onions from seed. These onions you'll get um, ripening in by the middle of the summer if you start seed. But these onions, the bulb onions, if you want to grow these from seed, you have to get them started back in January. So the only really practical way to do this, unless you want to run your pot in and out, in and out, in and out, um, is to do it in a greenhouse. So then there, um, the other way to grow onions is to start with sets. You can buy a whole bag of these little mini onions, and they're really last year's onion that they've dried. And they're like a bulb, they'll start growing this year. And you can use these to get green onions, or you can use them to grow different kind of bulb onions. The only disadvantage to sets is they tend to bolt. So we've said bolting is going to uh, making a flower, getting ready to go to seed. And when onions bolt, they make this tall flower stem and the, the onion itself gets really pithy in the middle and it's not good to eat. So really the most successful way to grow these big bulb onions is to buy bare root starts. And you can buy these in the nursery around the middle of March. And you dig a trench, you put your um, compost and your fertilizer in there, and then you just lay your onions out, cover this trench in. And I never need this many Walla Walla onions. That's really quite a few onions. So I plant mine close together. And then as they're growing, when they get to this size, I pull every other one for green onions or salad onions or raw onions. And I get to the point where I have the main, the biggest ones spaced about four to six inches apart. And I get these big onions in the fall. So you'll know that your onions are ready to harvest when the tops fall over. Okay, so as long as we're talking about roots, let's talk about carrots. Um, can I plant carrots in squares, like the, the square foot gardening kind of a design, instead of um, long rows? And the answer is you can plant them in any design you want, as long as you make sure that they're thinned. If you don't thin them, this is what's going to happen. So by thinning, I mean um, we're going to take out all of the little seedlings that we don't need. So if you just sprinkle seed in a row, carrot seed is really fine, and so is lettuce seed. You'll have this problem with lettuce and with beets. It's not just carrots. Um, you just sprinkle it in, and it seems like a really easy thing to plant, and they all start growing. They get really crowded like this. So you need to pick one nice seedling and then you need to pick another one about two inches away or whatever the spacing the seed packet recommends and you need to pull out all of the seedlings that are in between. And if you feel like you're disturbing the dirt too much when you pull those out, you can just take a little pair of scissors and cut them off. So it's a hassle, but if you don't do it, you'll, none of your carrots will be happy. So here's another root. What about potatoes? I have a great place to plant my potatoes. Can I plant them in the same place every year? And the answer is yes, but you're at risk of um, having trouble with diseases. So let's talk about growing potatoes for just a minute, and then we'll talk about what to do about those diseases. First of all, um, this is another one that you can buy at the nursery in the middle of March. These are called seed potatoes. 
And seed potatoes have been grown very carefully and they've been tested to make sure that they don't carry viruses. So you can plant the potatoes that are growing underneath the sink in your kitchen if they're sprouting and growing, but you run the risk that those potatoes might have a virus. And we're not talking about anything that would hurt you, it wouldn't make you sick, but once it's in the soil, it can cause all sorts of problems for the, for the potatoes. So seed potatoes are a safer bet. And then planting them, there are two different ways to plant them. If you want your potatoes to be big and mature at the end of the season like this, then you dig a deep trench, um, eight inches or more, put your fertilizer down in the bottom and put your potatoes in the bottom of the trench. And if you've got big seed potatoes, you can actually cut them into pieces if you want. Make sure that each one has at least two eyes. And then you just cover it with about two inches of dirt. And as this potato starts to grow and the green shoot comes up, after the green shoot is several inches high, you put in more dirt. And it grows up and you put in more dirt until you fill the trench all the way full. And then you just water it and watch it grow until the end of the season and you'll know that it's time to harvest when the tops die out. But some people would prefer to harvest little new potatoes. So if really, if what you're interested in is new potatoes, then don't plant your potatoes deep, just dig a, a shallow hole, just a couple of inches deep and put the seed potato in there and cover it with dirt. And then as it starts growing, cover it up with mulch or um, soil. And um, let me just pause here and say that you can buy early season potatoes and late season potatoes. If you want new potatoes, look for the early season potatoes. And if you want these mature, big tubers, look for late season potatoes. Okay, so I forgot to say that earlier. So here we are, it's growing, it's we're mounding up mulch as much as we can. And when this potato starts to bloom, which is usually a little bit after the 4th of July, you can start moving that mulch away and see if you've got new potatoes forming. And only take the number that you need for dinner and cover it back up again. And you can be harvesting out of a potato bed for, um, oh gee, a month at least, a month and a half. And if you want, you can harvest some and leave some. Now back to those um, soil barn diseases. Potatoes, whoops, oops, I'm sorry, come back. Potatoes are in the nightshade family. And other members of the nightshade family are eggplant, peppers, and tomatoes. So who would have ever thought that potatoes and tomatoes are in the same family, but they are. And that means that they share the same kind of diseases and viruses and pathogens. So if you would plant your potatoes in an area this year and in a different area next year and in a different area next year, the year after that, at least a three-year rotation, you are preventing any of those soil pathogens from really getting a foothold. And the same thing with brassicas. Brassicas, which is your broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, cabbage, these can also be affected by a soil-borne um, virus. So these are really important to rotate and the nightshades are really important to rotate. So you you're looking at the whole family. If you planted tomatoes in that spot last year, don't plant your potatoes this year. And so what I do is I plant potatoes and tomatoes in the same area and I rotate them together. And this will um, go a long way to prevent any sort of diseases from taking hold. So that brings us to the end of our cool weather crops. And we're gonna start the warm weather crops with zucchini. Is it better to plant zucchini by seeds or by starts? And the answer is that it depends. It depends on the time of year. It depends on the soil temperature and the weather. And it depends on how soon you want to be able to harvest. So this is a seed packet for zucchini and it says that it's frost sensitive. So after the last chance of spring frost. And in our climate, that's around Mother's Day. So we recommend that you don't plant these warm season crops until after Mother's Day. And 
Then it says 55 degrees, um, days, 55 days, and that means from when you plant the seed until you harvest those beautiful zucchini plants. But this assumes ideal growing conditions. It probably assumes a 60 degree soil temperature, which I guarantee you don't have right now. And it assumes that you're going to have warm weather. And if you've lived in this area very long, you know that sometimes we get some really cold, dreary weather in June. Sometimes we don't. But um, if you want to harvest in a hurry as soon as possible, you probably want to buy starts. And starts means that somebody else started the seed for you. And here it is ready to grow. And a lot of times the starts are bigger than this when you buy them in the store. So these can speed along when you get to harvest your um, crop by three weeks or even a month, depending on how cold June is. Um, starts obviously cost more than seeds. And that's um, something to factor in if you want to buy a lot of starts. You might choose to buy seed for some plants and starts for others. So if you do decide to buy a lot of seed, I wanted to talk just real quickly about storing your seed, your seed packages. Leave your seeds in these little paper envelopes and then you can put all of those paper envelopes into a Ziploc bag and store it in the back of your refrigerator. And that's just to keep it out of the way. Because seed stores really well if it's dry and it's cool. And you, these are big seeds. You can be planting these seeds successfully for several years. And I would guess with zucchini, you can get at least four or five years of planting out of this one package of seed. So that's another factor to consider. So while we're talking about seeds and starts, let's talk a little bit more about um, how to decide. The first thing is read your seed packet. And the second thing to know is that starts often work better or almost always work better for warm season crops that need to be started weeks before planting. So here's a seed packet and it gives you options. It says you can start your seed inside and it gives you directions or you can plant it outside and it gives you directions. But here's a tomato plant and this is the back of the seed packet and it says start seeds six to eight weeks before planting date. So that means you're starting these the, in March and April. And then the optimum soil temperature for germination is 75 to 85 degrees. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So there's really no practical way for you to grow tomato plants in your garden, planting your seed outside. So what about growing your own starts? Well, growing your own starts can be really fun and rewarding but it requires additional light because that tomato plant we just looked at, you want to start those seeds back in March or April. And in March and April, we don't have very good light. You'll read in the garden magazine or the garden books, and they'll say, once your seed is germinated and you've got these little sprouts, put them in a sunny windowsill. Well, we live in the Pacific Northwest and we go for weeks in the in the spring without seeing the sun. So we don't have a sunny windowsill in March and a good part of April. And even if we did in March, especially our days are so short, there's still not enough light. So trust me on this. If you want to grow seeds and you want to start them early, you're going to need to um, provide extra light. This is just a fluorescent shop light. You can buy these at any of the like at the hardware stores or, you know, Grover, Home Depot, Lowe's, any of those places. And you'll see that you're only a couple of inches above the little seedlings here. As these seedlings start to grow, there's a chain here and then you can adjust how the height of the light and you're going to raise the light up as the seedlings grow. This is one of the fancy LED countertop lights. It's got this nice stand and there's any number of these available on the market today. And you can even buy LED bulbs to put in um, fixtures like this. So you have lots of options. They both work. Whichever one seems better to you, just make sure that you give your plants enough light so they'll be healthy. So now what about peppers? I love peppers. Can I grow those from seed? And the answer is yes, but in addition to the lights, you also need a heat mat. 
Peppers originally were grown or um, grew up in areas where it was much, much warmer than it is here in our climate. And they really like lots of heat. And they will not, we're gonna talk about germination temperature. So seed germination is right here from this, where this little seed starts to sprout. And when we talk about soil or uh, germination temperature, we're talking about soil temperature. So we're not talking about today it's 85 degrees out. The peppers ought to be happy because it's 85. We're talking about the soil temperature and our soil temperature is probably closer to 45 or 50 still. So peppers would really like to have 77 to 86 degrees soil temperature to germinate. And the only practical way to provide that is to buy a heat net. So any of the nurseries or garden centers sell these, especially in the spring, and you take your flat, set it on top of the heat mat, and it raises the temperature of the soil inside this mat and it keeps it warm um, all day and all night. And this will give you much more success with your warm weather crops like peppers and tomatoes. So let's switch over to corn for just a minute. Um, I have people ask me all the time, can I plant my corn in a long row? And you know, they wanna plant it at the back of the planting bed, which seems to make a lot of sense. But the corn cobs are gonna be stunted if you plant it that way. And the reason is that corn is pollinated different than anything else that we grow. Most of our plants are pollinated by insects. Some of our plants are self-pollinated. <clears throat> corn is pollinated by the wind. So the way corn grows, you've got this corn stalk and up at the top, you have what we call tassels. And these are flowers and they pollen. And they release their pollen and the pollen blows around in the wind and it lands on the silt. And it turns out every kernel of corn on an ear of corn is attached to a piece of silk. This is one of my favorite pictures on the whole slideshow because I never knew this before. And that's why you've got all the silk coming out the top of the ear of corn, your ears of corn. And these all have to get pollen, pollinated to get a full ear of corn. I mean, a four, yeah. So, it's important for the pollen from the tassels to get down to the silt. So what they recommend is they recommend that you plant your corn in blocks, like square blocks, and they recommend a, a minimum size of four by four. So that's something to consider when you're planting your corn. Okay, so our last vegetable here is tomatoes. Do I have to pinch the suckers on my tomatoes? And the answer is, it depends on the variety. Have we heard that before? So um, it also depends on whether you want green tomatoes or red tomatoes. Our garden terms for tomatoes are determinate and indeterminate. Determinate means that the breeders have worked with the tomato plants and they have them um, bread, the determinant plants are bred to only grow to a certain height. And when they reach this height, they bloom, they make flowers, they make fruit, and they're done. They won't send any more shoots up and make any more flowers after this process has started. So a lot of your patio tomatoes or bush tomatoes, anything that says it's a short tomato is probably determinant. The indeterminate means that they will keep growing as long as they possibly can. They will grow, they'll make flowers, they'll make fruit, they'll send up another shoot, it'll make flowers, they'll try to make fruit, they'll send up another shoot, so you get the idea. They will just keep growing as long as you have good weather for it. If you look at the back of a seed packet, it usually tells you if your tomato is an indeterminate variety. It doesn't always tell you if it's determinant. If it doesn't say, there's a good chance you've got determinant, which means it's just gonna to grow to a certain height and, and be through. This one says it's gonna grow five or six feet tall, indeterminate habit, and it tells you how many days after setting out your transplant, you can go before you expect fruit. So let's talk about growing tomatoes for just a minute. 
Um, the planting is the same, whether it's determinate or indeterminate. The interesting thing with tomatoes is they will grow roots off of their stem if you plant it in the dirt. So if your seedling is tall enough, the recommendation is to break off the lower leaves. And then this is sort of the new way of planting tomatoes. You do um, dig this little trench and put the root ball as close to the surface as you can and make sure that it gets buried and bury as much of the stem as you can. And then you'll get a good root ball out of the new roots growing out of the root ball in the stem. And the reason for doing this is that it's much, much warmer a couple of inches below the surface than it is six or seven inches deep. So tomatoes love the heat and they really, really want their roots to be warm. And then if you're planting determinant plants like the patio tomatoes, you're done. That's all you have to do. But if you're planting the tall garden tomatoes, there's a couple more steps. Um, this step is called pinching. This is the stem and this is a leaf. And we have this little shoot that comes out between the stem and the leaf, and we call those suckers. Um, it looks really innocent right now, but if you let it grow, it will turn into another stem, just as big as this stem. And every leaf that you have on this stem and your new stem will make new little shoots. And so if you don't pinch these little guys out, you'll end up with a huge, beautiful green tomato plant that it won't even bother to make flowers until it's well along in its growth. And by the time it makes the flowers, it doesn't have time to produce very many red tomatoes before the frost comes. So you have to convince this plant and you have to communicate, I don't want you to be big and bushy. I want you to make flowers and fruit. So you pinch out all of these extra little um, shoots and the only option it has is to grow up and make flowers. And then the other thing you need to do is you need to stake it. And I can tell you from experience that the small round tomato cages that you can buy that aren't very expensive, a big tomato plant, once it gets full grown and it has lots of tomatoes on it, it will tip over and it'll take this cage with it. So these square ones, they work better. You can make, you can buy big round tomato cages that are a lot more sturdy. And um, either one of those work. There's all sorts of ways people do stakes and ties. But I wanted to show you the way commercial growers do it. Commercial growers put a stake in between each plant. And then as the plants start to grow, they tie off a cord um, and they go around every plant. And on this one, you can see he's gone on this side of the plant, he's gone around the stake. He's gone around the plant, gone around the stake, all the way to the end, and then he came back. So we have a string on both sides. On this one, he went on one side, one direction, and then he waited for the plant to grow, and he came back on the other side, this direction. Either one of them works. But it's, um, it's a really easy way to stake your tomatoes. I find it much easier than the cages. And I find that it works really well as long as you're consistent with your pinching. You can see right here, they've let that second stem grow and that's all. They've been really, really careful not to let any other of these stems grow and it's already starting to make fruit. And so if you follow all of these steps, you will have success. You'll have lots of red tomatoes at the end of the season instead of lots of green tomatoes. So that's the end of our show. I hope that there's been something helpful in here for all of you. Um, and I hope that you have a wonderful gardening season and be safe and enjoy. I wanted to share with you, so we will take questions in just a minute, but if you come up with questions later or you have other gardening questions, um, the answer clinic for the Master Gardeners is open from Tuesday through Friday, and here are their hours. And they are not taking walk-ins right now, so they're encouraging people to email, or if you prefer, you can um, call, and they will respond by email. So that is a really good resource. And then the other thing is a program they're calling Share the Bounty, and this one, 
is a new program that we're trying um, because there are a lot of people right now who are dealing with food insecurity. So if you're wondering how you can help your community during this difficult time, Share the Bounty may be for you. We're calling on home gardeners to share the food from their garden to help alleviate some of the food insecurity in our community that's been made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic. To join our community of gardeners helping others, visit our website, complete the registration form, and start your garden. You will be offered research-based garden education along the way, as well as options for places to share your bounty. And here's the website. It's the extension wsu.ed website with Share the Bounty at the end. And here's the email address for Erica Johnson, who's in charge of the program, and her phone number. So I think we're ready to take questions. Yeah, I just want to uh, remind everyone, um, some, some people came a little bit later uh, after it started, but uh, we are, you can ask uh, Joan questions by using the chat function. Uh, if you look at the bottom menu bar on your Zoom uh, window, there uh, will be a chat function. And uh, I want to say in advance uh, that there's a lot of people here, uh, and so I know we won't be able to get to all the questions. Um, but uh, if you'd like to ask one, uh, feel free to use that chat function and um, uh, also be helping out here. Um, but uh, Joan, yeah, maybe uh, do you want to start with that first question about uh, how far apart, how, excuse me, let's scroll in there. Uh, how far apart should you plant pepper plants? Mm -hmm. Oh my, well, the best recommendation for how far apart to plant things is to read the seed packet. And if you're buying starts, it usually has instructions on the little tag that says, um, gives you ideas about how far apart to plant them. You probably want them at least 12 inches and maybe 18 inches apart, but it depends on the variety you're planting. So um, I would say, look at that little tag. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, I've got another question here uh, that's uh, talking about overwatering tomatoes and uh, uh, the question is, uh, when do you know um, when to water or how to avoid overwatering? Mm -hmm. Oh, watering tomatoes. That's a really good question. The, um, the best way I've found to water my whole vegetable garden is those soaker hoses because I keep them on a timer so that I know how much water they're getting and I know how often they're getting it. And the general rule of thumb is that you don't water until the top of the soil has dried out. So if you go out and you put your finger into the soil, maybe half an inch down, and you're already coming into wet soil like you would right now, you don't need the water. But come July and August, you put your finger into the soil that far down and you will find um, that it's dry. And so as soon as that happens, you know that it's time to water. The biggest problem in our area about overwatering is the rain. Because you can be really careful with your watering schedule and then you can get a rainstorm and what happens when tomatoes that are ripening are overwatered as they split and there's really not much you can do about that. Okay, um, I see a couple questions about um, how do you deal with slugs? Uh, <laughs> recommendation for slugs. I do. Um, the best thing to use for slugs is uh, a product like Sluggo, which is a brand it's um, I iron something or other. I'm going to get this wrong now, but here I'm sitting here on the video. But it's not a poison. It, um, it's actually ingested by the slugs and it affects their digestion. It takes them a few days to die. So it's not nearly as gratifying as regular slug bait because regular slug bait, you see those slime trails and you know that you got them. But the trouble with slug bait is that it's a poison. And um, iron phosphate is the product that we have in Sluggo. And if you put that out right now, it doesn't dissolve nearly as quickly as regular slug bait does. And so it will stay active for quite a while. You'll be getting your junior slugs right now and it'll make a tremendous difference later in your garden. Okay. 
Um, I, I'm seeing a couple questions about how to uh, save seeds for the next year. Um, I have one question uh, that's about a tomato plants that you really like and um, how do you save and grow the seeds for the following year. I have basically the same question for um, asparagus uh, and how do you, when do you stop harvesting it and let it go to seed? Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are probably two different things. As far as saving seed, that is a conversation for another day. There is quite a bit that you need to know to do it successfully, and we don't have time to talk about it now. So um, you've got some contact information there for Erica Johnson. If you'd like to have a webinar on seed saving, I would say give her an email and let her know that it's something you're interested in. There's lots of good books and there's lots of good resources on it. As far as the asparagus goes, um, once those spears start growing and they're just as small as your little finger or a pencil, you need to leave them alone and they will grow up and um, you'll stop harvesting. Most of the asparagus nowadays, the roots that you buy are the male plants and they're not gonna need to make seed. So you don't need to worry about it. Um, I'm having, I see a question here about uh, asking if you could say a little bit more about um, planting onion bare root starts. Uh, what do you do after you lay the plants in the trench? Do you have to set each plant upright in the trench and cover the bulb part with soil? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I used to do that. That was how I did it. I got down on my hands and knees and I made that trench and then I very carefully squished all the dirt together so that all the plants were pointing upright. And one of my fellow master gardeners said, you don't have to do that. <laughs> they said, those plants, just put them at an angle like that picture I showed you, and they will start to grow, and they'll grow up straight, and you're fine. So the biggest thing would be to put a little bit of um, compost or an organic amendment in that trench before you plant them with a little bit of fertilizer, and then just cover them up and keep them watered on a fairly regular basis, and they'll be good to go. Okay. Um, I have a question from a self-identified new gardener with her first season. Uh, awesome. And she was asking about um, any um, tomato varieties that you would recommend for container gardening. Oh my gosh. Um, you know, I haven't grown tomatoes in containers, so I'm probably not the right one to ask for that. I would go... The nurseries, several of the nurseries are open. They have... Um, limited access right now, but I would talk to someone in the, in the nursery and ask them what their recommendations are. Talk to someone who knows more about container gardening than I do. <laughs> okay. um, I also uh, have a um, notification from Erica Johnson that uh, the Master Gardeners is hoping to offer a seed saving talk soon, so yes, just uh, let everyone know about that. And um, I have one here, hopefully I can uh, um, uh, get this question right. It says, when should I augment my soil and with what? Do you like steer manure? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, that's really sort of a question. It's a big question as well. I'm really um, a fan of compost and I make my own compost. Composted steer manure, composted, you know, mushroom growing, um, any of those composts that you buy commercially are good. You just want to add organic matter to your soil. And I'm also a fan of organic fertilizer. So if you mix organic fertilizer and a good compost, that is a really good basis for planting. So I put it in my planting holes when I'm planting, or if I'm planting like a row of something, I, I put it in the row. I don't spread it over the whole bed because um, I just really want it where the roots of the crops are. Okay. Um, I have a question here. Uh, uh, this person uh, says she accidentally planted uh, garlic cloves in the spring and it has green shoots. Should I pull it out and start over since I didn't start it early enough? <laughs> no, I wouldn't pull it out. I would let it grow and see what it does. I mean, what do you have to lose? And what you'll probably end up with is what they call green garlic. And it, you can um, harvest garlic when it's more like green onions and chop it up and put it in stir fries or scrambled eggs or whatever you'd like to do with your green onions. But it has a garlic flavor. 
It's not nearly as strong a garlic flavor as the cloves, but you can still eat it. Um, this question uh, is actually about um, grapes and strawberries. And it says, uh, should we cut or prune or pinch new shoots on grapes and strawberries? I was intrigued with what you said about tomatoes. Okay, so grapes need really serious pruning and we may be past the pruning stage. I'm not a grape expert, but um, grape vines need some serious pruning and it varies with how old the plant is, how you prune them. So that's more than I can talk about. Um, strawberries, they recommend that you pinch off the little runners that come off of this, the mother plant, especially um, while they're you know, getting ready, they're flowering and getting ready to bear fruit. You don't want them to be putting energy into those runners and then let the runners go later to make little baby plants if you want to. Um, had a question. Uh, that's, uh, should I plant uh, tomatillos the same way as tomatoes? As far as I know, the answer would be yes. I've never done it, but read the instructions. It's, I think they're, um, they're similar, so I think you'd be pretty safe. Um, and I have another question here about um, uh, lime. Uh, when do you recommend it, if ever? So I do recommend lime plain what they call agricultural lime. You can buy what's called Calpril, which is a brand. It's, um, it's really fine. Anyway, the dolomite lime is a different variety that a lot of places recommend. The trouble with dolomite is it's got a couple of different chemicals in, or minerals in it. And if you use it year after year after year, you can get in trouble. Regular lime is just calcium carbonate. And the best time to add it is actually in the fall because it's a ground up rock. It's, you're just adding ground up rock and you want it to dissolve so that calcium is available to your plants. But if you haven't added it in the fall, go ahead and add it now. At least you'll have some that's, dis, um, that's dissolving the soil by the time the plants are growing. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, about uh, burpee uh, green stringless green bean seeds. So this person planted uh, 48 um, seeds about three weeks ago. At best, I have 12 plants coming up, half of which are more yellowish than green. Is it something I did or the seeds? Nothing is happening in the ones I planted in containers, which the seed bag said you could do. You know, the, the weather up until the last day or two has been really chilly and beans don't really like cold weather. So I would give them another week or two before you give up on them. Um, I think it's really likely that they just didn't like the soil temperature. And that would be the same in the container or in the ground. Um, then I have another question about uh, Japanese eggplant. Um, uh, this person says they haven't had much luck with it. Uh, is there any uh, tips you have uh, specifically for Japanese eggplant? Mm -hmm. Why, I don't. That's something I'm not familiar with. So I really don't have anything to offer on that one. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, so hopefully, hopefully I'm getting this question right. It says, um, I inherited potatoes in my plot. Um, in my house, can can the last can they last year after year? Um, hopefully, it, does that does that make sense to you? I'm, I'm trying. I well, yeah, I, I think it. probably what what they're saying is they bought a house and it had a garden and the potatoes are coming up. Mm -hmm. And probably what happened is whoever had it before harvested the bigger potatoes and missed some of the little babies. And that is really easy to do. <laughs> I also have potatoes coming up from last year where they were last year. And um, yeah, they will probably be fine and you can just let them grow and do everything we talked about today, either look for new potatoes. Um, they're probably closer to the surface of the soil, so they would probably be a good candidate for looking for new potatoes sometime after the 1st of July. Um. I uh, have a question. It says, I planted some cucumber seeds two weeks ago and nothing has come up. Do I need to replant? Well, see, there's the problem. The weather is so cold, the soil has been so cold, 
a lot of those things, um, even if you can start them in the house and uh, in a little pot until they come up just a little tiny bit, this time of year, you can put them outside and let them get some sunshine and then wait until a warm day like today and they should grow just fine. If they haven't germinated in two weeks, I'd probably go ahead and replant them because there's a good chance they rotted. Okay. Um, and maybe this is related. Um, says, uh, my basil is uh, so yellow. Uh, too much water, question mark? Um, probably too cold. Basil really likes warm weather, and it's been way too cold for basil. 